watching as they come down through the tri -oval. Drama, dedication, smiles, heartbreak, and at times, sheer terror. It all happens here on the racer stage, the racetrack. Hello everyone, I'm Benny Parsons, and this is perhaps the grandest NASCAR stage of all, Daytona International Speedway. Man, the history of this place has seen, including a victory in 1975 when I took the checkered flag at the Daytona 500, and my life has never been the same. But on this stage, and at the other tracks of NASCAR, the difference between thunderous applause of victory and the loneliness of losing, it all boils down to fractions of seconds and flashes of courage all taking place at critical moments on the track. On this very special home video, we're going to take a driver's eye view of NASCAR's toughest tracks and relive the sport's most unforgettable moments. Also helping us out will be some of racing's most respected crew chiefs, the men responsible for chasing the ever-changing track and setting the car up to meet each track's unique challenges. You can rest assured we'll be talking about this place later, but our first stop, Pocono, one of the circuit's vexing venues to drivers and crew chiefs alike. This nemesis of the north is a place where the high speeds of the super speedway meet the complexity of the road course, a particularly damning combination. Pocono, to me, by yourself, may be the hardest racetrack that we go to because of three different corners, three different exits, three different entrances, three different straightaways. Every time you go around Pocono, when you're going into a corner, it's totally different than the corner you just came out of. So you mentally have got to change what you're going to do for that corner. And physically on the race car, it's like you need three different setups. So somewhere on the racetrack, your car is not going to handle well, and you just got to drive it. You just got to tolerate it, because you've got to give up what's good in one place to make up what's bad in the other. As far as making a car handle one of the toughest racetracks, to me, it's, it's Pocono. You know, because of the three different turns, the, the banking is different in all three. You got the long straightaway where you can't give up uh, a lot of drag going down the front straight. Pocono is really unique because the transmission gurus and the motor guys have got us shifting uh, into overdrive. So basically, third gear is our common gear. And once we get past the start finish line, probably a good quarter of a mile, we take the RPMs and get them to about 8,100 8, and then and just slam it back in the fourth with the Jericho transmission. Don't use the clutch, just pull it back real hard. Go on down to about the, the two marker. We use the, the, the markers, one, two, three. About the two marker to let off the gas. Once you start getting down in the corner, take it out of fourth gear and just shove it up in the third. It goes up like in butter. It, uh, the, the ratios are so close it doesn't disturb the tires. Uh, and it's such a, a long and fast straightaway, you got to get slowed down a little bit slower than you think. Peel on down through one, and uh, it's a pretty fast corner from there on, wide open, off the corner, and then uh, the most dangerous corner about all racetracks in the United States is the, the trial, which Bobby got hurt at. Uh, it's a real tedious corner. You just get through there the best you can. You want to arc out and shoot it through the trial. And, uh, and then turn three is a long, flat corner and you just do everything you can, sort of like the Milwaukee Mile or Phoenix, get around that flat corner as good as you can and on down the straightaway. Pocono's treacherous triangle shape offers unique challenges to each crew chief, and each one has his own approach. I think the key to uh, success at Pocono is being able to get off of uh, turn one and two and through the tunnel turn good, and then carry good speed into turn three and off so that you can carry good straightaway speed down the long pond straightaway. How your car goes through turn three, it's going to determine how it runs and looks all the way down that long front straightaway. Normally though, the situations I've been in, when you get it working good in turn two and turn three, you'll be just fine in turn one. Also, we get into something there that we only get into at one other racetrack, and that's shifting. We use all the different gears in the gearbox, and aside from the road course, the only other place that we shift is Pocono, Pennsylvania. Several years ago, nobody shifted at Pocono. Then along come one or two cars that shifted. They run pretty good and people started looking around. Now, if you don't shift at Pocono, you pretty much can write yourself off and be a competitor. Has to be terrifying for a driver to turn in, to go into turn one at Pocono at 195 miles an hour and have to shift. 
I mean, he's got his hands full, but he, all of a sudden he's got to shift at 195 miles an hour. He's got to do two things. He's got to downshift that car to where it's in the proper gear when he comes off the exit of turn two. He's got to concentrate on turning the car and getting it through turn one. And also, even though Pocono's a two and a half mile racetrack, you've got to be on the brakes. You've got to get yourself rolled down because you've tried to stay on the gas just as long as you could down that long front straightaway. One mistake at Pocono can be costly, especially if it takes place at the famed tunnel turn. It's where some of the sports greats have turned the place to high drama. Davey Allison, the main player in this disaster, went on to challenge for the 1992 Winston Cup, but one year later would tragically lose his life in a helicopter crash. How costly can one mistake be at Pocono? In 1995, future Winston Cup champion Jeff Gordon learned the cost of a flubbed performance when, after dominating a race, a missed shift cost him a victory. The shifter that was in that car that day was more designed for a road course use and second to third gear on a road course gate is a little bit straighter and uh, God bless him but his little arms are kind of short and he just he, he wasn't doing good at, at reaching it all day long and uh, there was a lot of pressure on him on that last stop and, or on that last start and he, uh, he tried to hurry it up and he did miss a gear. While in 1993 the great Richard Petty's son Kyle turned in a great performance as he mastered the turn turn and shifted perfectly through each corner to dominate the triangular monster in unprecedented fashion, leading 148 of 200 laps, an incredible performance that is surprised Kyle captured on film. Pocono's newly repaved surface hasn't changed anything. The racetrack may be smoother and faster, but the key is still shifting at the right time to get the most out of your race car. The new service only ensures that this nemesis isn't going to stop hunting drivers anytime soon. Pocono is complex, but our next stop is nothing short of simple, tough, and torturous. But while Bristol Motor Speedway holds few surprises, the high banks of the bowl in eastern Tennessee is a place where the action never disappoints. My side of the racetrack, look at Dale Earnhardt in third place, and Earnhardt spins coming off too. And here's Pummel coming off of turn four. Hutch Strickland is into the wall hard. Oh, it's a contact. And Colton Jeff Gordon spin. And the caution is out. And Gordon bumps the wall before he can save it. Oh, and Blake Speed spins up in turn one. And another caution waves. Of all the short tracks of NASCAR called bull rings, Bristol is definitely the hardest house to play. It takes a combination of physical and psychological stamina, combined with a car set up for a performance that can last 500 laps and earn a checkered flag curtain call. Let's take a lap from the driver's point of view. Bristol is, is neat. You, you get the start finish line and, and number one, you're bouncing. You're bouncing, okay? Uh, you get in the corner and there's a dip and you, you hit the dip car pushes, you turn it, I mean you turn it, you turn it, wide open in the gas, everything feels good, then you get off a two, and there's another bump, and this time when you hit, you don't go down, you go up, and you're already against the wall anyway, so you're, you know, now you're turning right, going to three, it's another hole, you hit that hole, the car goes down, it bottoms out, it pushes, crank the wheel again, and the same thing off the four, and you just hit off a three. Bristol is a bear. A bowl-shaped track that is banked 36 degrees in all corners and 16 degrees in the straights. Staying out of trouble for 500 laps here is next to impossible. 500 is tough. Uh, the G-forces at Bristol are unmatched by anywhere that we go. And on top of that, the lap I took you on was by yourself. When you put 36 other people out there, it all of a sudden gets a lot more interesting because everybody else is just as out of control as I just told you I am. So. 
to watch a race at Bristol, it looks like everything is real calculated and everybody knows what they're doing, but the truth of the matter is, half of us are just out of control hoping for the end of the race. Shocks are really critical at Bristol. As you, you go down the straightaway at Bristol, the car wants to lift up and drop down onto that banking. It really doesn't climb up the banking, so if you have a shock that's too stiff on the rebound side or, or when the car comes up, when you go over a bump, when you hit a bump with your car and it goes down, we call that compression. When the car comes back up, we call that rebound. So if you have a car that's too stiff on the rebound side, it has a tendency to lift the wheels up off the ground and give that driver a very, very scary feeling going in. And as you know, it's not a good feeling to be loose in. And then when it hits the middle of the corner, pow, it slams down on the ground. And then you have to start to set your chassis to get up off the corner. There's no better or dramatic example of how Bristol wears you down than the night race of 1993. Mark Martin battled back from two laps down to taste the bittersweet reward of center stage at this truly tough speedway. When he reached the winner's circle, he couldn't even acknowledge the hard-won honor. However, on a rainy night in August 1995, the stage at Bristol saw performance like no other. After a lengthy rain delay, the field finally took the green flag. Early on, Dale Earnhardt, everybody's favorite villain, tangled with Rusty Wallace, a star of the short track circuit. Dale was sent to the back of the pack for his indiscretion, but it was his cue to live up to his villain as the intimidator. He took center stage and charged to the front of the pack, making dramatic moves to lap traffic. As the final reel unfolded, he caught race leader Terry Labonte. That moves him to six. The white flag this time around. There's Earnhardt lurking in second position off of corner four. Terry Labonte gets the white flag, but still has his traffic to contend with. Jeff Levine has to come in for a splash, splash of gas or a flat tire or something. Now let's see. They're down to four or five car lengths. And a slow car by that Earnhardt. He's right on his back bumper. Let's see what strategy he pulls. Oh! Wait, how about that? Whoa! <laughs> that wasn't finished, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, I'll tell you. I just, our Kellogg Chevy ran great all night there. And lap cars, you know, were running side by side, racing each other at the end. And uh, uh, Dale caught me. He gave me a little shot in the back there, and I just stood in the gas. And, uh, you know, we beat him across the line. I've been in, in a wreck before in the last lap, but not one. Uh, but never, never quite like that. What an incredible performance. Now another setting where the racetrack itself helps to make things really interesting are the road courses. Suddenly turning only left for a living isn't enough. And when the Winston Cup crew visit the road courses, a whole new challenge awaits. The road course, and I'm real reluctant to say this as a crew chief, but your driver does make a big difference at a road course. We've had some, some champions, some excellent race car drivers come through the ranks, but when they got to Sears Point, Riverside, or Watkins Glen, they would struggle. And I think a lot of that would be just their capability to do the, all the things that's required. But it asks a lot out of the race car because you've got to have an excellent motor combination. You've got a motor that runs at, you've got to run at low RPMs as well as high RPMs. Handling's real important because there's not a whole lot of straightaways at the road courses, especially at Sears Point. Brakes are real important at the road courses because you're trying to get as much speed as you can. As we spoke earlier, you want to stay on the gas as long as you can on straightaway. So what that's going to make you do, getting in the corner, you're going to have to get the car stopped and slow down. So brakes is real important at the road courses. To a lot of people's surprise, people would think that we really turn a lot of RPMs at the road courses. We really don't turn that much RPMs at the road courses except at just a few places. Normally, as you said, we'll be turning in the high 7,000 range, maybe around 8,000. At some places, you'll see it run up to 8,500. But you've got to have the gearing and the motor combination to go with it to where you never lug the motor, but you've got enough power to pull you through all the straightaways and on the exit of these corners. Because we've learned today that any time you're not turning the most RPMs you can at any point of any racetrack, you're laying power down on the bench. You're leaving power behind. So we try to turn as many RPMs as we can at every racetrack we go to, and that means on every straightaway of, of the two road courses. Sears Point may be difficult, but Watkins Glen isn't any easier. Let's take a look at Watkins Glen. Basically, you go down the straightaway, which leads you into a right-hand corner that's downhill, but it's really a fast corner, so it, and it's pretty simple. You get in there, if you get in a little bit hard and you get off, 
the track a little bit, you got the rumble strip. It really doesn't upset the car that bad. You shoot it up to the next right-hander, which leads into the S's, and it's an uphill. You, you, the first right-hander is uphill, and then you're, you're carrying a lot of speed. You got to turn the car left immediately, and when you do that, you apex it right there at the curb, and then you let the car go all the way out to the guardrail, so you're, you're not scrubbing off any speed through there. So when you go through there, you get right on the guardrail, which goes into a fast right-hander down the back stretch. Then you, you lead into the chicane, which the chicane is really tricky. Uh, it's hard to get in there because the entrance of the chicane is really uh, pretty tight. So you try to get in there without, you used to, you could clip the curb on the inside, but the curbs are higher now. So you have to get in there as clean as possible. And there again, you're turning the car real quickly back to the left and back to the right through the chicane. And it's, it's, it's pretty hard to get through there fast, but I don't think you ever get through there where it feels good. That immediately puts you in the carousel, and the carousel, again, is a lot like Sears Point. You try to run the inside as long as you can, but the car is on the verge of breaking loose there at any second. That leads you on to another sh short shoot. Uh, you get up to fourth gear. You enter a left-hand corner, which is fairly fast. You normally just drop one gear for that. Uh, you go through there. That's a, a similar corner to turn one where you can, get off, you can slide off to the right and there's rumble strips there, so you can use a lot of racetrack. Squirt the throttle to the next corner, which is the last corner, which is a right-hander, and that is another one that's a fast corner, and you can carry a lot of speed through. And as you exit the last corner, there's a curb on your left, which you can use if you have to. Now, Sears Point isn't the only road course where the toughness of the course has led to some unforgettable moments. Ricky Rudd and Rusty Wallace gave a performance for the ages as each tried to upstage the other in the final corner at Watkins Glen. Rusty will try to make a final move here. They come down through corner number six now. Rusty is going to have to make a move if he wins this race. I don't think he's going to do it. I don't think he can do it either. Ricky Rudd is too smooth. He has the line that he wants. He's keeping the, using the racetrack to his advantage. He's going to slow it down. They're oh, turning they, they bump. They bump. Here they come off the seventh corner. Who's going to win it? They're side by side. Rusty is well off the track. He cannot win it, and Ricky Rudd does. Unbelievable. That last three laps, I tell you, that was something else. I saw Rusty coming. I, I saw Daryl. I was sitting Daryl up. I was going to get him in turn one with about uh, three laps to go. I was going to outbreak him. Then, then he developed some kind of a problem. I don't know what happened to him. But then here come Rusty, and he, he was coming hard. And uh, I, was like, I was mirror driving, just trying to block him. We were a little bit lazy coming on to the front straightaway. I knew where he was going to make his run because he, he showed me a couple laps before that, and I just blocked his line, and he ran into my back bumper, turned me sideways, and he got in the dirt, tried to pass me on the outside. It was really something. Well, I've always gone road racing uh, with a real positive attitude because I just enjoy them, so I always go there looking forward to them. Uh, but you, the tracks, they're a lot different. There's, there's really hardly any com uh, comparisons that you can draw between oval track racing and road racing. So the guys in the past that, that used to dread going to a road course because they really couldn't relate to them at all are the guys that usually struggle with them. But uh, you go there with an open mind, and a lot of guys do that today. A lot of guys have run real well on them. But uh, it's, a, it's very difficult to run these heavy cars on a road course. You, the drivers have to physically work very hard inside the cars. And uh, a 60, 80 lap race at, at Watkins Glen or Sears Point probably compares to a 500 miler at Rockingham. We've seen what it takes in the bull rings and road courses, but aha, perhaps the ultimate stage, our sport's most dramatic settings are the super speedways. Dramas here, both sad and sweet, take place at a hard stop in 200 miles per hour. Now, if there's one place that reeks of drama and history, one truly tough track with truly unforgettable moments, it's right here, Daytona. Hey folks, look what I've got, the keys to the Pontiac Trans Am pace car. You want to go for a ride around the Daytona International Speedway, about 110 miles an hour? If you do, come along. Can't wait. All right, let's start at the start-finish line. Start a lap around the Daytona International Speedway, two and a half miles, very low as we go through the tri-oval. Then we let the car drift back out against the outside retaining wall, trying to keep the car as free as possible. 
the bottom groove, the faster way around this speedway, so we can go in high and dip right to the bottom of the racetrack. It's a little bumpy down here, as you can see. That's where the crew chiefs have a problem getting those shocks. Perfect, so the guys can go through these corners and not lose control. As they come off the corner, out against that outside retaining wall once again. 3,400 feet backstretch, turn three. Looks like it's about a foot wide. As you go down the backstretch, it gets wider and wider and wider. Then return three. Once again, high, dipping down to the bottom of the racetrack. Oh, big bump back there. If you fix your car to July the 4th and, and hold it wide open, I don't care if you start 40th, uh, you're going to win the race. Because uh, the guys got to start lifting, lifting. You know, sometimes you get loose, sometimes the car starts pushing. It's like you come off the, the corners and the front end just picks up and you got the wheel cut and it just keeps going. And uh, you have to adjust that a lot and uh, you have to watch for it. And, you know, in practice it don't show up sometimes. And uh, once the race starts, it, it get all the cars out there to show up. The key to conquering this place is an invisible friend or foe. It's the air on the track, which keeps your car stuck on the track with downforce. But it also provides resistance. How your car manipulates the air as you go through the corners determines your available horsepower. How all this works is called aerodynamics. And it all comes together with drafting, which is how you combine the air that's going around your car with another car. And together, you end up going even faster. How critical is drafting? very critical. You have to be smart enough to, to stay with that lead pack and when it starts to split up you've got to know who to go with and then when you do get in position to be leading the race you've got to be smart enough to know how to block a guy's run at you. I think especially by the time race day comes along at Daytona, chassis is, is real important because normally I mean how many pole sitters at Daytona for the Daytona 500 has actually won the race? It hadn't happened a lot if you look back over the course of the year. On qualifying day, it's pretty much who's got the most aerodynamic, least drag race car with the most horsepower. Handling's still important. Your driver's still got to be able to, to stay on the gas all the way around without backing off. But one thing that's become real important with restrictor plate racing, and we've learned this through some of our data acquisition, is the least amount that the driver moves the steering wheel, he'll run a faster lap. If, he has to, if the car is pushing and won't turn as good and he has to turn the wheel more, even though he hadn't backed off the gas, with as little bit of horsepower as these cars have with the restrictor plates, when you turn the wheel, it bogs the motor down. It scrubs speed. So we have to make that driver hold that steering wheel just as straight as he can, even through the corners. And, and that's what we have to work on. That's where handling becomes real important. Uh, Daytona in February is a lot more Pucci friendly than it is in July. Uh, it's, it's normally pretty predictable. It stays about the same in February. In July, the track has a tendency to start tight, go very loose, uh, loose entry. Uh, as you go off into the banking, the back end of the car wants to swing around, and as you get in the middle of the corner, it still feels like it, it's trying to turn itself. And then as the exit of the corner, when the car starts to come up out of the banking, it gets a very severe push. And you try and adjust around it. You make your car adjustable with spring rubbers, pieces of rubber that we put in the spring to make it stiffer, softer. Um, we'll start with a, a minimal or a maximal amount of wedge, so we've got a window that we can adjust on. And a lot of it is air pressure, fender, and spoiler adjustments. But while the draft and downforce can keep you going fast on the track, the story of a race can have a terrifying ending when it all goes wrong like what happened to Darrell Waltrip in 1991. Uh-oh, we've got a problem. Sure, Darrell Waltrip is still up. Uh-oh, Waltrip is still up. Darrell Waltrip tumbling down the backstretch in what appears to be a very, very serious crash. Sometimes, Daytona comes down to the last few laps. Let's take a look at this restart in 1995 when Jeff Gordon held off Dale Earnhardt and Sterling Marlin for the win. Here we go, Jeff Gordon has the field in tow, looking for the green, it's out, the green and white simultaneously, one lap to decide who wins, the Pepsi 400.
Jeff Gordon. Oh, he'll ask lead. We have contact between a couple of cars, but everybody keeps it straight. They battle for position. Sterling Martin down to the outside of Earnhardt. He has to be by Earnhardt. Jeff Gordon, though, has about a car length and a half lead on Marlon and Earnhardt as they battle for second position to the third and fourth corner. That battle side by side should give the race to Jeff Gordon. Here they come. Jeff Gordon has the lead. Earnhardt moves to the inside. They scramble. It's Jeff Gordon winning. And I think Marlon got second. When we won the July race there last year was a pretty favorite moment of mine. It came down to a shootout between Jeff and Dale Earnhardt again. History, tradition, uh, banking, uh, now the restrictor plate. Everybody wants to win at Daytona. You spend a lot of time over the winter. Uh, it's like Indy is to the, to the IndyCar races. Daytona is a very important place and there's always extra effort there. Many believe that for pure drama, Daytona has been the stage for some of NASCAR's most unforgettable moments. The track's greatest star, no doubt Richard Petty, and the two will be immortalized forever. Together they have stage performances that read like Hollywood scripts. 200th win, July the 4th, President of the United States, you win it on the last lap. I mean, you know, it was everything that you would ever want to get into one race, we put it all together in one day. At that time, Kale was running super good, and I was running super good, so we got to racing with each other and, then, and uh, come down to the last four or five laps. Uh, you know, we've been changing the lead, and I think we just got in line, and he was following me waiting for the last lap. We ran side to side down the front stretch, and I had the inside groove on him, and uh, we touched a few times, but anyhow, uh, when we got to the start-finish line, I beat him by a couple of three feet. I had him set up right exactly where I wanted him, uh, waiting for that final lap. Slingshot him to the to the finish there, and uh, the caution flag came out with uh, three laps to go. I said, "This thing's gonna finish under caution. I gotta go now. I don't have time to set him up like I would have if it was two laps uh, later." And uh, so I made a run at him and got by him down the back stretch, but didn't have enough momentum to to, to stay in front of him, you know, till we got to the start finish line. He beat me just uh, just a foot. And uh, that was a tough one to lose because I had him just had him just where I wanted him, even though I'm glad, you know, that he won his 200th. But, uh, it, uh, and the bad thing about that, Benny, was I knew whoever got back to the start finish line was the winner of the race. Well, my brain jumped out of gear. It was two laps left, see, so next lap, thinking, you know, well, he beat me, the race is over. I came down pit road and still had a lap to go. <laughs> Went from second to fourth, I think. We was able to pull it off and uh, never pulled any more of them off, but we, I guess we used up all our luck in that one race. Richard somehow made everything he did at Daytona dramatic, even when things went wrong. I got more publicity out of that one wreck than winning seven Daytonas because every, every sports uh, program you'd see for the next week or two weeks, they would have to show that leading in or leading out of a sports deal. So we got a lot of publicity out of it, but the big deal was I was able to walk away from it. That was, that was a situation that you just look at and say, well, the good Lord was, was, just didn't, didn't want you to go that time. He was wanting you to be spectacular, but he wasn't ready to take you. Look at Richard Petty coming up on the inside. Come and on, King. What are you doing down there? He's showing muscle early in the race. On the first lap, he goes three wide into turn number three with Greg Sachs in the middle and Derek Pope on the outside. And here we go into the fourth corner now. Boy, somebody's got to give there. <laughs> three of breast racing. Look at this. Coming out of corner number four, they touch. All three cars are touching as they come down through the tri-oval, but everybody maintains position. Wow. Oh no, Sachs is in trouble. And takes Petty with him. And we're going to have a terrific crash here as nearly all the field is going to be involved in this crash. There are only about 10 or 12 cars that survived this melee just past the starting line. But when it comes to truly great performances at the Great Daytona, you have to point to the all-star cast that was assembled back in 1976 with Richard Petty and his arch rival David Pearson leading the way, it may have been the most dramatic finish in NASCAR history. I was there when Petty and Pearson crashed at Daytona, right there at the end of the race, and I just couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. It was just incredible. And the way those cars were smashed in the front, like, you know, 
I'll never forget that. It was a big race, the Daytona 500, everybody wanted to win it. And what amazed me more about that race than anything else was when he got out of the car, he wasn't mad. I mean, I would have been slinging stuff and throwing stuff and screaming at everybody, but, you know, he got out of the car and said, hey, you know, we'll go next week. And he was tickled to death to come out of here with a second place finish, I think. So uh, that was the biggest race for me. Just a situation that, uh, you know, came down to the end of the race with David and myself. And uh, I was trying to win, he was trying to win. We run into each other and uh, just wound up being a, a heck of a race. As they hit the banking, they're three abreast with a lap car. Pearson moves in front of the STP Dodge. Petty comes back to the inside. They almost touch as they move down low in the banking. They're going to be side by side as they exit the bank and head for the finish line. Richard Petty goes back in front. They both spin. They're in the wall. Petty is sliding, slamming into the wall. He's coming down toward the finish line. Will he make it? He's still moving. The car stops. 300, 400 feet shy of the finish line. Pearson is still running. Here's Petty trying to fire to come across the line. David Pearson moving down through as they come to the stripe. The winner is car number 21. He really had me beat if we hadn't a wreck. And uh, of course, I waited and waited and drafted by him going down the back stretch, in which he just come right back around me between three and four. And uh, coming off of four, I guess he thought he was by me or something. And uh, anyway, when he pulled up, he wasn't quite by me. And of course, his right rear hit my left front. And when it did, both of us spun around and crashed and hit the wall and everything else. When we hit, uh, naturally, uh, I didn't know where he was at. And I was spinning around and uh, the Wood Boys said I was on the radio talking to them while I was spinning, hollering, where's he at, where's he at? Because I couldn't see him on kind of the smoke and stuff coming up. But uh, after we stopped and just everything cleared, and, you know, I kept on going. I was teed off because I couldn't get the thing cranked up. I guess it's more, I wasn't worried about David, I wasn't worried about nobody or nothing. I was just trying to get across the line because I knew if I could get across the line, I could win the race. And, you know, once the, when it hit the wall, spun down through the infield, I thought it was going to continue to spin. I said, well, you know, I'm going to win this race backwards or sideways or upside down or something. But stopped about 20 yards short of the start finish line. So uh, that was a disappointment, like I say. I guess it flooded the car when it was doing all the spinning and I never could get it cranked up. Now that was a truly incredible performance. Bravo. And when I see it, I still hold my breath. And hey, by the way, let's look at that finish again. See that white car crossing the line? That's me finishing third, one lap down. Why did Pearson keep moving? For all the drama of Daytona, there's still one place that's tougher. And the place that has been the stage for its own incredible and unforgettable moments in NASCAR racing. It's a place that practically gives stage fright to drivers and drive crew chiefs crazy trying to find the perfect setup. And man, that place drove me crazy during my career. I once crashed on the first lap and I was starting from the pole. Now where is it? You got it. The Lady in Black. The track too tough to tame Darlington. Darlington's just uh, the, the corners are, um, are, are tough to get around. It's narrow, it's real fast. Um, only takes a few laps, the tires give up because of the, the surface and uh, it, it just makes it where it's slippery, so um, that makes it real tough. You know, certainly the, the track that I'm sure everybody's mentioned and, and has to be considered the toughest is Darlington because, the, you know, it was built for cars to run 120 maybe, 100, 120 probably at the most miles per hour. And now uh, we go out there and run almost 170 at it, you know, and certainly over that on the straightaways. So makes for the room you got to race very narrow when you use what you got to have just to make a lap around there. Uh, particularly turn four, getting off of there is extremely tough because to run a good lap there, you need to hold the throttle wide open all the way through. And uh, at times there just isn't enough room to do that. A place like Darlington probably would be one of the most difficult races, uh, corners to get around, I think, because of you know the, the deterioration in the racetrack and the slippage and the heat playing a factor. Uh, I'd say that probably. And it's very, very hard there to stay out of trouble you know you you get raced in other cars and you get yourself in trouble you're better off just racing the racetrack setting as fast as pace as you can without getting yourself in trouble and see where you end up at the end of the day it's not the toughest it's right there with them I think that and the reason being is that number one it's very narrow uh, number two both ends of the racetrack are different than each other and number three you run 185 miles an hour down the straightaway so 
you're going 185, almost 190 miles an hour going into a corner that was designed to go 150 miles an hour into. So I think that as the cars have evolved into faster machines, the track is, is a little bit wider than it was in some of the footage I see where you were running on it, but it's not a lot wider. And uh, the wall is no softer. So <laughs> I, I think that that's probably why Darlington's one of the toughest. Man, mentioned Darlington, and everybody is a reviewer and critic. Now let's let Kenny Wallace take us on a lap around Darlington. It's about a one and a half groove racetrack. One groove getting into the corners. You know, you go down the front straight away and you know, you take your left front, put it on the white line, and if you want to do the Harry Gant, Dale Earnhardt thing, you keep a lot of momentum in the middle of one and two and let it slide up to the wall, so to speak. That gives you a lot of, a lot of area to work with coming off of two. That's the, the line that I used in the first race. My brother Rusty, he preferred to peel it around the white line through the middle of the corner. Go down the back straight away and about, about a half of a car can fit, fit in turn three. And uh, that's a high speed corner. You really want to feed it through there with very minimal brake. Uh, let off the gas just for maybe a second, right back on the gas, wide open up to the wall, you know, through three and four. And then start rotating off the gas a little bit, kind of early. Harry Gant taught me that to get it set to be wide open coming off the corner. So uh, I run wide open through that corner, start, you know, letting up on the gas a little bit early, about three quarter throttle, and then wide open coming up off the corner and down the start finish line. I think the key to Darlington is uh, is patience. I think you've got to you you you've got to run hard, but sometimes at Darlington, even in qualifying, if you run too hard, you slow down. Three and four, you can get real aggressive. You can run hard, and you can. You can pretty much just throw it all out the window over there, but in one and two, if you get into one too hard, you mess the whole lap up. If you get back in the gas too quick, you mess the whole lap up. So one and two is more about patience than three and four. The key corner, the moment of truth, comes in turn four, the single toughest corner on the toughest track in Winston Cup racing. If you don't make it through the corner just right, you won't be taking any bows. We work on three and four and get it the best we can so he can keep his foot in the throttle all at one time, not not that he, we, we work on trying to get it so he doesn't have to ever come off the throttle. It doesn't matter where he gets on that throttle, but I just want him to never have to get off it. And then we'll, once we get that, we'll work on one and two, as long as it doesn't mess up where he's getting on the throttle in turn three or four. Turn three and four is wide and sweeping. Actually, we feel like the turn four is actually two little separate corners with a little straightaway in between. To get the car where it's tight enough, where the rear end don't break loose off two, when you get that to happen, the car won't want to turn over and turn four and the driver has to get off the throttle to make the car turn. You got to try to reach a compromise between the two corners and, and get it to, to not be loose off the two and to turn over and turn four. You just got to get mad and mean and grit your teeth and, and talk to yourself. I mean, because you're really, you're really struggling with the race car. You're trying to make it do something that it doesn't want to do. You got to stay low off turn four. You can't really get side by side. So uh, if you want to pass somebody, you got to set them up about halfway down the back straightaway. So because uh, you know if you get side by side turn four, chances are you might not make it out. But there's a good chance you could, but sometimes you don't. So you don't want to take a risk. Not surprisingly, a track this tough has provided some unforgettable moments. One of the best was back in 1993 when Ernie Irvin and Dale Earnhardt took center stage in a ferocious door-to-door -door battle that had the fans on their feet lap after lap as the lady in black seemed poised to pull them into the wall. Then there was that one magical afternoon when a brash future champion, Darrell Walter, transcended the limitations of the treacherous track to script himself a storybook finish. He battled perhaps the greatest of them all, the great Richard Petty, lap after lap, passing with abandon back and forth until he seized victory and sealed his future in the sport. Well, you can see it happening right before you. They're coming to turn three. Two more turns to go. Richard Petty still side by side. Donnie Ellison is still hanging in in third. Oh! Petty has got to leave it. There comes Walter down below him as Petty stood up high. Donnie Ellison trying to move past Petty into second place. They're coming to the finish line. It is Darrell Waltrip winning the Rebel 500. Petty is second. Darrell and myself were racing, and uh, at that time, I think uh, Donnie Allison was third, and he was back a pretty good race. So uh, we got to racing each other. I'd pass uh, on one lap or on one corner, and uh, Darrell would pass me back on the straightaway or on the other corner, 
We went back and forth, back and forth. We must have passed each other like a couple of times a lap for the last three or four laps. This is back when the track was really treacherous. It was slick, they bear greased it all the time, and you really never raced anybody, you only raced a racetrack. Come down about 10 to go, and Richard hadn't really been all that good all day, but he finally he caught me. And the first thing you know, Richard and Donnie, Allison and I were in a real dog fight. And uh, Richard and I were passing back and forth. We passed each other four times on the last lap at Darlington. And I mean, we never touched. It's not like we ran into each other, knocked each other out of the way. We literally, he passed me going down the front. I passed him in turn one. He passed me in turn two. We passed again going down the back. We passed again up in the middle of three and four. And all the time, Donnie was sitting back here watching all this, knowing that if we screwed up, he had to race one. But anyway, we come down to the white flag, and as I said, we passed each other four times. And uh, we go into the third turn, and we're side by side. Richard's on the inside. He's got the preferred line. Donnie is lingering back just far enough so that when we crash, he can get through. We get to the third turn. I run Richard in as far as I can run him, and then I just slam on the brakes. Richard goes in too hard. He goes up the hill. I turn hard left, get in the gas, drive between him and Donnie Allison, pass Richard because he's about to hit the wall, get the lead, win the race. He just wound up being in the lead on the right, right time. If it had been another lap, I'd have probably been in the lead. It's very exciting. It was, it was a super race. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, even though you run a second, you, you teed off at yourself for letting somebody beat you, but you know you was in a race and you know you did as good as you could and uh, you know you felt real good about it. Darlington. Man, that's a great racetrack. Flub your line, and if you're lucky, you'll come away with the famed Darlington Stripe. Blow it, and you'll pay the price. Well, that's our tour of NASCAR's toughest tracks and the most unforgettable moments. Each race, each day, each track, each driver, each crew chief. The combination is a never-ending interplay that together make NASCAR the most exciting and heart-stopping story in the world of motorsports. I'm Benny Parsons. Thanks for joining us.